it, it sounds like you had uh, a bit of a reawakening. You, you spoke of how it was in that eight in 2008, being in the team and, and what you've learned from it. And, and, and I remember that eight racing, particularly the heat in Beijing. I mean, I think it was one of the best British eights that I've seen in terms of how, it, how that heat was. And I, I've, I've got, you know, a notion that there was a, a, re, a regret, certainly with, with you, but the, the eight, about the way you raced the final and, um, you know, which the Canadians won and you took a silver medal. Looking back on that, what's your perspective now? Uh, <laughs> I well that eight was awesome I mean the, both both eight, you know the, the London eight was great as well they're they're very different com completely different culturally but that eight was such a blast um uh because in, and by the way that eight was more than just the the nine people that were in it on that day it, it all you know huge part of that eight were, were both um Robin Bourne Taylor and, and Tom Salisbury who were in the pair, you know, um, uh, we, we, you know, we rotated that eight through the season, but um, yeah, I mean, we got to this situation where we got to Beijing and um, we knew we were going well. Uh, we'd just been progressing, progressing, progressing on, on training camp. Um, and we were massively the underdogs. Um, and our hotel was just behind the start line um, uh, in Beijing. So, you, so, yeah, so we got to Beijing. We're the underdogs, and we did that heat, and we absolutely walloped it out the out the blocks. I mean, I think we won by like seven seconds or something. It was huge, and it was so easy. It was so easy. Like physically, I got off the course, I felt like I'd done nothing. And then we saw the time, and we were a couple of seconds faster than the Canadians in their heat. And and suddenly, we, you know, you go from this real underdog at, um, to holy cow, we've really got. A <laughs> You know, we've really got a shot here. <laughs> if we don't mess this up, we could be Olympic champions. That's pretty cool. Um, but what was interesting is back then, uh, um, uh, which was different to London, is that the eight was always on the Sunday. So we basically raced our first race on the Monday, and then we didn't race again for a week. Yeah. And, and our rooms were right there behind the start line. So for a week, you go into your training session on the lake, you know, right, okay, what do we need to focus on? Okay, well, we need to go faster out the block, so we need to go faster than the Canadians. Okay, well, no, 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 duh. You know, Canadians are going to bolt it out of the blocks. Well, guess what we got to do? And we're listening all week to this, you know, attention, you know, day after day after day. Um, and you could just feel the tension in the crew, although everyone's trying to stay cool, you know, everyone's trying to keep the same, like, jovial underdog atmosphere. And there was some, you know, Rick Eggington, you know, Tom Lucy, some guys just, you know, always up to, to no good and tricks and whatever. Trying not to get too bored, trying not to touch anyone because we're putting alcohol gel on our hands the whole time. And, you know, when you're, because we heard about this virus that broke out amongst the other team. So all this kind of stuff. So you're just managing that stress for the week. And I have to say, when we got to, got to that Sunday, we're the last race of the day. I walked into the uh, Olympic Park, it, you know, through the gate and Mark and, um, uh, and Zach were um, crossing the, the finish line, winning their gold. You know, the four had won the gold the day before. We'd beaten all these crews on training camp on percentage. It was like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, and I just think that, you know, it's it, it's it, the, the kind of the pressure and the tension um, was was huge. Um, Jürgen spoke to us before the race. That was something that had not happened before um in any of our other races i don't think that was necessarily the right thing for us it going into the final but that's what happened um i seem to remember even rick got into the boat the wrong way around or something like that even when we put, you know it was just like super pressure um and then we paddled up to the start um and it was like dead silence not at all like what it was before um and yeah we went up we went out the blocks um you know, we got to the start line, went out the blocks, and within the first couple of strokes, there was a bit of a dodgy stroke. Um, uh, when it, yeah, and got got a bit caught, and then it just kind of within five strokes, we just tensed up, and it, you know, the next 20, 30 strokes weren't good enough, uh, and then the Canadian slipped away, and that's you know, that's really how how fine it is in the Olympic final, one bad stroke, and that's it. Yeah, start in the eight, you know. Um, so so yeah so i mean when when you say a little bit of 
regret is uh, or not regret uh, disappointment. I think you know we were all super pumped to come away with Olympic sol silver medal, but I think at the time we definitely knew we could have done better. I think we still know we could have done better. Yeah. Like, if you unless you you have a, a you know unless all your strokes are good, uh, it's difficult to look back and go well. Do you know what? That's the result. We, but that's sport. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, I actually look back at it now, and I, I just think it was incredibly awesome to deliver the result we got. Because if you look at the race, I thought we were way further ahead of the Americans than we were. <laughs> it was only that much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. Did, how much influence did that result have on the way you race the eighth final in 2012? Because, you know, there's a number of you, you know, yourself, you mentioned uh, Rick Edgington. Um, yeah. Uh, was it Langers too had been in that eight? Um, because that, that 2012 race was a remarkable, you know, final in terms of racing to, to watch. How, how, how influenced were you by what had happened four years before? Well, I think, for, first, I, I kind of want to address this. So I heard, you know, your great interview with, with Kath Bishop, and she's just written that great book on the long win. Um, and, you know, looking at sort of win at all costs uh, concept and, and mentality. And I think the reality is of sport, you want to win. I mean, the objective of sport is to win. <laughs> Um, it's not to it's not to come second, um, but I really understand what what she what she means about you know the wrong culture is you know are you successful as an individual based on just your results of being winning or not is not the right thing, um, and and it can take all sorts of different people to be winners. You know you don't have to be this person who. Uh, you know sulks and, and throws their toys out the pram if they don't have a win because that doesn't mean you care enough um so so yeah i think i think there's there needs, still needs to be a lot of looking at how how how, how sport and 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 um, groups manage their athletes when they try and achieve success but in rowing and definitely under Jurgen's program and because of the great work that yourself you know you and steve you set it up in 1984 you know, and ever since then, the the flagship of performance in rowing is in, is gold, right? Yeah. And Jurgen Jurgen's system got stronger and stronger and stronger that we were able to to achieve more and more and more golds, and more and more golds across across the team, multiple boats, but boat classes, etc. And Jurgen, um, Jurgen has such a has such a, an amazing track record of golds. Your measure of performance is. Is gold, <laughs> um, and and so, and and we had and, and and certainly back then, and and also I think for the next four years, we had enough athletes that you could you could say that we we had the potential to win gold. You know, the definitely within that London 2012 eight. If we got everything right, if we didn't have the injury through the season, I think we definitely could have won gold. Really, hundred uh, percent. Yeah, but we you know that's that's the things that I explained earlier is that you know. One, we we lost Stan early in the season um, uh, to a back injury, so he didn't get a race that entire World Cup season. So his first race of the Olympics over the international season, even in a senior boat, was the Olympic heat. Um, uh, so that, that that's one element. And then two, we then you know we spent so much time changing the crew around that season between World Cups, and results were all over the place. And then we then lost our confidence as athletes we lost our confidence within each other and then we started creating our own problems which were things that didn't need to be there so i'm just trying to highlight that that yeah yeah those are things that can make boats go slower and they don't need to be there um and that would be my message to to athletes and to, to anyone is is that just try and really understand like is what you're focusing on that important because if it's not and it's not going to make the boat go faster then why are you doing it yeah. um and that you know ben hunt davis they had a great culture in that crew and that's why they they achieved that success um and in London, um, it was amazing, right? London, you know, the Olympic venue is like 25 minute drive down the road from here, from my house. Um, that's a pretty special thing. And when you're paddling around in the warm up and you, you know, you see your neighbor or the local window cleaner and they're there and they're shouting out your name, you know, go on Alex, or, um, you know, it makes me pretty emotional now to think about, remember those moments. You know, I, I tell a story about, 
the day of the Olympic final when we walked uh, into the Olympic Park and we went through our special entrance, which is you know down the river in Windsor. And uh, and I put my bag through the the, the checkout, um, you know the, the you know the, the scanner yeah. to get in the park. And um, the 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 Royal Marines were working there, and this guy had like a little bit of a you know like that. And uh, and I, I kind of was like, all right. And then I then I walked through the through the scanner, and I saw ahead of me, and it was about 150 volunteers in a long line. This is about 6:15 in the morning, um, in a long long line up to the bridge where we cross over into the lake. And they would just gave us the standing ovation as we, you know, walk down that line. And I, you know, I'm, I'm getting teary eyed talking about it now. Yeah. I can tell you then I was, you know, I had my sunglasses on for a reason. Um, and if I can feel that emotional energy that I feel now, I can tell you what, it was a thousand times for what I'm feeling right now. And, 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 and there was no choice in the matter of, of what you were racing for. You know, the, the, you had no, no choice but to race for gold or nothing else because you owed it to everyone that was there that was doing this amazing thing for the London Olympics. And I so wish the London Olympics were now to kind of re-energize this, this, uh, this country because it just created the most amazing energy and positivity in people. And maybe that's what we need, <laughs> you, know, you know, now, but I remember that moment and the night before, you know, we, we, it's been building up all week and, and we, we basically talked the night before the race and there was, you know, the 10 of us, the 11 of us sat in this room and and we talked about what what it meant to us. And, you know, uh, it got, you know, you, you got guys six foot eight plus got tears in their eyes, you know, and their hearts are on the table. And we made this choice to try and do something the next day that we'd not done. You know, we just not done before, which is to go for the win or nothing at all. We made the choice to be in the lead by 500 or 1,000 and to keep going until we were in the lead because that's the only way we could beat the Germans. Um, and we made a choice to do something that no one had done before for the last four years because no one had done it to the Germans. And so that's a pretty terrifying thing to do, make a choice of the night before the Olympic final, because by the way, there is no other Olympic final after the next day. It's that, that's it. But we made that commitment to each other. And the commitment was, I'm going to take the 10 hardest strokes of my life. And then when I finish those, I'm going to then take the next 10 hardest strokes I can possibly take of my life. And I'm just going to keep doing that until we're in the lead. Uh, and, 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 you know, maybe there you know maybe 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 another four years later and experience in the same crew you know we would have been able to hold that hold that form you know in through the last 500 and quite a few of those guys went on to do that you know in rio i think what what what, what happened is we got in the lead in a thousand you know just and we were then neck and neck and we were going pretty well and as you entered into that huge funnel of noise you know in the olympic stands and it had happened in the in the heat and the rep it would, it, and, and, and unless you've done Olympic Games in that kind of amphitheater, it's difficult to explain it or to get someone prepared for it. But it's so loud. It's so loud. It shakes the boat. You know, it shakes everything. And to, to maintain your form, you have to be so composed and to not. And, and I think as we entered into that, you know, the emotions that you're feeling, the the, the exhaustion that you're feeling, da, 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 you know, the boat just kind of fell apart and then and then the wheels really started coming off and and as we were getting closer and closer to the line you know i'm in the bow seat and i'm like literally counting every single stroke <laughs> um as we were in that last 250 and i can see the whole field just coming back at us i know the germans are gone i can see the canadians like flying through on the inside on the other side and i see like america holland australia you know everyone's flying back and we cross the line and uh, it, it, it went first Germany, second Canada, and then no results came up. And I was like, n nothing came up for about a minute and a half, something like that, two minutes. And I just thought, we did it. We 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 went for gold, and we've come away with nothing. Um, and then the result came up the board, and it was it was the bronze. And do you know what? It's a damn sight better walking away with a bronze medal than coming in fourth. <laughs> Because yeah, yeah, yeah. At least you get something, you know, um, and 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 it, it, it's taken me. I think it has taken me six years, seven years, wow. to kind of appreciate that. Do you know what? Bronze is not gold, but do you know what? it's still a good result. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there you go. That's my story of London, twenty twelve. <laughs>
That's compelling. It's really compelling to listen to, Alex. There, there, there was just before I know in in that season before 2012, you were very. It's very close between you and TJ for who was going to be in in that four. Um, you'd been in you'd been in the four. You'd won a gold medal in 2009 in Poznan. I know you know that uh, 2010 the lanes were unfair. You didn't get the result that the season's performance merited. Um, but you, it was between you and TJ, and you you took the decision on training camp. I think to to basically go for the eight rather than stay in the in the mixing pot for the four for selection. Uh, yeah, I mean maybe uh, yeah. So re retrospectively, so in twenty twelve, I wanted to uh, the, what, what I what I wanted to do is I wanted to cross the finish line in London. And I wanted to have no regrets. I wanted to have no stone unturned from myself in terms of a physical performance and a, and a, and a mental performance. And I wanted to dictate my destiny. I wanted to dictate, you know, when I crossed that line, I didn't want it to be down to somebody else's decision um, on, 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 on selection or anything like that. So I made two decisions. I made one decision. I, I said, I'm going to win. I'm going to, I'm going to win an Olympic gold medal or do the absolute best with anyone that I'm put with in any boat class that I'm in. Um, whether I'm in the pair, the four or the eight, doesn't matter. Um, and I had a great year. I had a really, really good year physically. Um, and um, I think Alex and I were a little bit unlucky at trials. I'm not saying we would have beaten Andy and Pete, uh, in that that year, but I think we would have potentially been a lot closer in the final trials. He was he was ill, um, and then we went through a kind of a period where both Andy and um, uh, Alex were were kind of ill or injured for quite a few weeks, and then we went on training camp to and so so the selection wasn't finalised between me and TJ, um, and I felt I was in great condition. I'd done everything I needed to do to be selected, and the, uh, and everyone else had been selected except for me and TJ um and you know this really played on my mind a lot over that six weeks uh because it's incredibly frustrating i just felt like time was being wasted getting ready for the olympics um and then we got to Varese. even for Varese, we we're putting the boats together um and still wasn't told what boat i was you know we weren't really told what was happening and then uh i think it was late one night on either the first or the second night of training camp Jurgen got us together and he said, right, tomorrow you're going to do a pairs matrix. Um, uh, and it's going to be you and TJ, um, Alex, and with Andy and Alex. Um, and then whoever wins that pairs matrix is going to be in the four. And I just thought, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, because I felt that the um, consistency between Andy and Alex, uh, having been ill and injured for that amount of time, wasn't a fair trial. And I just didn't want to go to the Olympic Games based on, you know, maybe I would have won, maybe TJ would have won. I mean, TJ is a phenomenal, a phenomenal oarsman. And, you know, he's quite rightly won two Olympic gold medals. So maybe I wasn't good enough, but I felt like I'd done enough to be selected. And I just didn't want to to, to go to the situation where, let's say, even if I had lost it, that, that, that I was uncomfortable with that bit of selection. So I just said, you know what, it's fine. Um, if you wanted to select me, he would have selected me already. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just said, look, I'm going to go for the eight. Um, I think the eight's got a really great chance of winning, um, and um, and you know, I, that's my decision, and, uh, and that was it. And how do you view that now? Um, I think they they really they had a tough season, right? You know, they do they didn't go fast straight away. Um, and and they weren't really rowing that well until the end of the season and i know that a large reason of why they managed to turn things around was was the was the the way that alex and and tj got everyone to sit down and look at how they were rowing and they got they what tj is excellent at doing is creating an environment where that conversation has to be had but can be had in a uh really balanced way and i think Compared to me, I get pretty intense, and I can, <laughs> I I can be let sometimes be let the um certainly back then I, I can let the emotion, you know, sway how I wanted to to work through those things, and I think potentially I wouldn't have been able to do what what 
what TJ and Alex did uh, in those last four weeks to turn their turn their rowing around. Um, and so I think retrospectively, it was, you know, the right decision. Um, but I think the other thing that I, when I look back, um, is that, and this would be my message to athletes now, is that there was a lot of pride. You know, I had a lot of pride in in my decision making. Me, me, me. I'm going to make sure me. But the reality is, is that sometimes you need to just swallow that pride and follow the process. Um, and especially when you've got someone like Jurgen who's running the running running the ship, and and the process is pretty pretty um, significantly proven. And I think that's what Alex Gregory ha- has done incredibly well, and why he was such a great athlete is that he just he 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 was very good at following the process and he knew that if he had Jurgen in his corner he was gonna he was gonna win yeah 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 you, i mean we've talked about some some great rowing names do, do you have um is, you know this is a difficult question and there may not be an answer to it but do you have like you know who's the best guy that you've rowed with or been in the boat with do you have a do you have a sense of that now uh that's a pretty tough question because really? i really- a lot of people it's you martin <laughs> <laughs> no one no one as silky as martin cross in a bow seat um I, i've rode with some amazing people uh i've rode with some amazing people post the squad i have to say one of the best people i've ever rode with in in my career is mark weber um oh. from germany uh he stroked r8 and and, uh, and uh, he's just got an incredible I just don't even know how you would describe it for his size and just um, he, the way he moves a boat is just um, amazing. Um, I was really lucky to be able to row with both Hodgie uh, and and Constantine uh, Lel- Hodgie Andrew Hodge and Constantine Leludis, um, and uh, and then also Alex Gregory, and they were all just phenomenal, all in slightly different ways. And then you know with with Matt and. And James and Stevie, so it's really tough. <laughs> really, really yeah. tough. Yeah. I would say I would say there's probably two people that are kind of unsung heroes in my in my rowing career, and and um, I will give them a shout out. Is um, I actually did juniors with Robin Bourne Taylor. Oh, uh, Robin Bourne Taylor um, uh, was also you know in the eight uh, with me in 2003. So we, we rode together for many many years, and um he he was an incredible incredible fighter and 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 um one of the things that he taught me is you always but how you always back yourself um and he just had this ferocity and determination in his training and the way he would race and the way that he could end himself physically you know that was just awesome so that he's that's one and and then the other one is um uh, unfortunately his growing career was cut short as a guy called ben birch he was in the eight with us in 2002. He was president of the boat race in 2002 uh, for Oxford. And, um, you know, he had terrible, terrible back problems. But that eight, um, up until Ben and Robin both got in it, was all over the place. And it was a complete mess. And when I talk about leaders as athletes, um, you know, what, what Ben and Robin were able to do was to galvanize that group of people and create a shared purpose um, and a belief in each other that that was was immense and i think that you know rowing is about lots of different things it's about you know athleticism and your physiology and technique but it's also about it's also about that it's about that leadership to drive and believe in something beyond what you think you can do and that's why you get results that are greater than the sum of the parts that's um and what about you know the best crew you've rowed in do you look back and and you you have a particular favorite crew or you go that this this was really outset can you can you do that at all because you've been in so many great crews um so i reckon uh my favorite crew was definitely the the eight from 2008 uh they were you know it just it was just awesome you know you had like josh west you know phd genius tom stallard uh you know formula one race engineer now with mclaren and then you had you know sadly we've lost him now asa nethercott this super brain and then you had me and uh you had tom lucy who literally just wanted to go and shoot guns at people in in the marines and you know it and al hethcott one of the greatest characters in, <laughs> in rowing it was it was loads of fun rick eggington matt langridge colin smith you know just that was just a great 
great crew. Um, and that was really cool to be part of that under, underdog journey. Um, but then also I was in that four with um, with Langridge and Rick and, and Alex, and, and that was some of the best rowing and, and technical rowing. And I mean, some of those races in Lucerne, we just won by so far, you know, it was just awesome. Um, so yeah, no, they, those were great, great crews and great fun. Yeah. Uh, but best race, best race ever, best race ever. 2001 semi-final of the Visitors' Cup. Oxford Brooks, <laughs> with Tommy, Tommy Burton, Gareth Corey, and James Brown and myself against Danny Marrett, Dan Oosley, Angus Warner, and Angus Rivers. Oh, and wow. We won by a foot. And I think we were rating 47 down the enclosure. <laughs> having gone below 41 for the first <laughs> three quarters of the course. Um, so anyway, did you win? Uh, well, one thing I wanted to say because I know you're you're a family man, Alex. You're very much a family man now. And um, how important is is family to you? How how important has family been to you through this? You know the process we talked about when we we started out chatting. Uh, family's everything. Um, you know, uh, I probably didn't recognise that as as well as I should have in my early days as being a, being a parent because I was you know still focusing very hard on the rowing and probably too self focused. But um, now you know, like, it gives me no greater pleasure to try and teach my kids and inspire them that they can do things that they that they didn't think were possible or to to you know, get their horizons that anything is possible. Um, and um, and I just love like jumping. If they say, you know, we want to go climb up Penny Fan, we'll jump in the car and go climb up Penny Fan. You know, if they say they want to go and do it, you know, a 510k run and, you know, which we did uh, with all of them before the age of five, you know, all right, let's go. You know, they swam in the river with me this weekend, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and it, it's, it's about, it's about breaking down those, those barriers and, um, and, and helping them recognize that anything's possible. Um, and yeah, so family's everything. Wow. And, you know, in, in turn, you, you mentioned in the future, you're, you're part, uh, you're going to be a mentor in the True Athlete Project. I mean, how's the future looking for you? What are you, what are you looking forward to in the future? Um, so I work, I work, at the moment I work with, um, at, at the moment, I, I work with Wagestream. Uh, we're a social enterprise fintech. Uh, and basically, we're trying to help improve the poverty premium by uh, helping people avoid having to enter the cycle of, of debt. Um, but what's really cool is like it's a social purpose business. And the future for me is uh, I want to help society. You know, I want to help people. As long as I'm doing that, I'm OK. Um, and there's so so much that we can do, whether it's just inspiring you know, ten local parents to go on a sunrise run, and 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 that's free. To you know, really complicated technology that helps people access their pay in real time. I mean, it's it's great to just be involved in things that improve society, and that's why I love what you're doing, Crossy, because you know you're helping pass on messages about rowing and all around the world, and 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 sharing that knowledge is 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 awesome because the sport just gets better for it. Yeah. Alex Partridge, you've been, it's been amazing. I can't believe we've been we've been over an hour actually talking. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for the experience. Uh, thanks very much for everybody tuning in. Thanks for your comments as well. Uh, we'll end the live part of this broadcast now, but just to say, Alex Partridge, you are an absolute legend and hero. Thank you ever so much. You are too, Crossy. You are too. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great Christmas and uh, looking forward to a better 2021.